talking. This is Jesus himself talking. So if you must be a good Christian, this is where you really got to get the meat of what Christ is talking about. People don't go to the book of Matthew because it's too much. I mean, you have to change your life 360 degrees. So they skip it and teach other stuff. They might pick here and there, but it's a lot in this book. So tonight, what's going to come out? Don't think I'm picking on you. You should blame it on Jesus. Amen? Because I'm hard stuff here tonight. You know? <laughs> so, and this is amazing. Matthew chapter 5. Last week, we, we dealt with, we ended in verse 37, talking about our communication. Letting your yes be yes and letting your no be no. Amen? Jesus Christ said to us last week, there is no point taking an oath. There is no point to swear. I mean, if you speak the truth, if your yes mean yes and your no mean no, what is the point of saying I swear? Because you speak the truth. Amen? Amen. That's basically what he's saying. He's saying if you are going to speak the truth all the time, there is no point to take an oath because the Jews, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees they will take an oath so you believe that what they're saying is credible. But you don't have to go to, I swear by the Almighty God, or I swear by the bench, or I swear by the altar, or I swear by the pastor. And you don't have to go to all of that. Just speak the truth. There's no point to, to take an oath. That's what Christ is saying. Amen? But something else again. Uh, please, Brother Eddie, book of chapter 5 of Matthew. Chapter 5 of Matthew. And we're going to read verse 38. And I believe we would stop at verse 42. We'll try to deal with these verses today. Ye have heard that it had been said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, Ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Up to verse 42. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compare thee to go a mile, go with him too. Give to him that asks thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So now we are in this passage of the scripture where Jesus is telling the Pharisees, that first of all you must understand, that their primary audience at this time were the Jews. Speaking to the Jews, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. And of course, this word also applies to us today as Christians and as believers. And he started by telling them the same line, ye have heard what I say. The same line. So what Christ is doing here is, first of all, he needed to mess up their theology Break them down so that they are broken enough to accept Christ, knowing they cannot help themselves. Because these are a bunch of men that believed on self-righteousness and twisted the law so that they make themselves feel good and look good. They really changed the law. They changed it for their own good. They changed it so that they make them feel good that they are good. And Christ is saying, nope, you all got it wrong. Now, this thing that Christ is dealing with here is very serious. He said, you have heard. It had been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And the Pharisees love that. Because as you know, in the human history, human beings, because of sin, humans are very vindictive. Amen. You, they all call, you are vindictive. I mean, they want to revenge. You do me this, I'm giving it to you. That is the heart of man. You mess me up, I'm coming after you. You think it's over, just give me some time. I'm going to pay you back. 
You kill my child, I'll kill yours. You take my tooth, I'll take your tooth. You, you pluck out one of my eyes, I am plucking out your eyes also. So the, so the Pharisees twisted the law. Now, this is not what the Bible teaches. But I'm going to help you tonight. If you remember, months ago, I taught you by telling you that there are three categories of laws in the Old Testament. The moral law, the civil law, and the what? And the ceremonial law. Thank you. The moral law deals with men and God. Civil law, how they govern themselves. Ceremonial law, how they worship God. So the Pharisees twisted the law. This law, okay, let me just back up a little bit. The, the moral law, we find that in the book of, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, sorry, Exodus chapter 20 talks about the moral law. Moral, moral, M-O-R-A-L. How do you say it? Moral, all right, moral law. Then chapter 21 to 23 talks about the civil law. And this law falls under the civil law pertaining to the judges, and the magistrate had to deal with civil offenses. But the Pharisees, because of their vindictive nature, switched it around and make this look like it's a moral law. Or make it look like you take my eye, I'm taking your eyes too. You do this to me, I'm going to revenge because the Bible says an eye for an eye. So they misquoted the scripture and twisted it for their own benefit. This was not meant to be how we deal with husband and wife or brothers and sisters. It has to do with the law, the civil law of the land. But the Pharisees felt they want to take the law into their own hand to justify revenge. So the Bible says this. It's like Jesus Christ telling, uh, it's like them saying to themselves, the Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery. And they believe that. But the Bible, Jesus said, listen guys, you guys got it all wrong. If you look at the woman with lust in your eyes, you've done it. See, that just messed them up. And it's not a physical thing, it's a heart issue. The same thing with them here, they, they twisted, they changed things around and said to themselves, you know what, the Bible says an eye, the Bible does an eye for an eye, but it's not referring to how we deal with each other, it's referring to how the law deals with offenses committed by the citizens. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. It's like the law in America will say something like this. If you commit a crime, let's say an example, you commit a crime, let's say you, you do you I. They lock you up in jail, right? Right? Who locks you up in jail? The government. Right? But what they did was then was that if maybe somebody have a DUI in the family, they lock the person up in the basement and tie them up. Now that would not be right, right? Is they let the civil law takes care, let the magistrate, let the judge handle that. It is not in my place that because you killed one of my loved ones, I should take a gun and kill you also. Amen? Amen? Amen. It is a place of the court to make a decision, the penalty that comes along with the offense, and that is what that's for. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, is to guide the civil authority, how the judges and the law and, and the magistrate handles when offenses come. But the Pharisees took this as the law that they need to apply in every case. 
So what am I saying here? What I'm saying, first of all, is to let you understand that this particular scripture is not referring to how you and I deal with our neighbors. Jesus is not saying you should go, or the Lord did not say that you should go and hurt somebody because they hurt you. It's like, it's like for instance, it's like somebody uh, by accident or by design drove into your yard with a heavy truck that has 25 or 40 inch tires and mess up your lawn. This law, quoted by these guys, means that get your own truck and mess the law. You do me, there's this, there's this adage in my country, which is part of this law. You do me, I do you, God no verse. <laughs> I mean, you did me, I pay you back with equal. But that's wrong. Yeah. That means, quote, that is what the Pharisees are doing. You do me, I do you, we even. Now, that's not God. That is, that is misquoting the scripture. And they even quote the Bible. The Bible says, an eye for an eye, you mess me up, I'm coming after you. If you mess up with my wife, I'm coming after you. If you mess up with my daughter, don't mess with me. I'm killing your whole clan. And people do that. Even here in this country. You mess with me, just don't mess with me. Don't mess with me. Because I'm coming and I'm wiping out all everyone. Your husband, your children, just don't mess with me. But that is not the case. What Christ is saying here is that you have heard. But I tell you, you have heard, you have heard that it has been said an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but that is not the way it has been designed to say. So there are three places in the scripture that talks about an eye for an eye. And, and I think I should share that with you so that way you know where they're coming from with that law. Only three places recorded in the Bible. And the first one I wrote down here is the book of Exodus chapter 21, verse 23 to 25. Just write it down. Numbers chapter 30, verse 2, and uh, uh, chapter 19 of Deuteronomy, verse 21 where the Bible talks about an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, and all of that. But that law is meant for civil law. Somebody says civil law. It's not your relationship with your fellow man. There is no place in the Bible that God recommends us to revenge. The Bible says, as, as we're going to deal with in, in a few minutes, the Bible says vengeance is the law. That means that if somebody hurts you, it is not in your place to pay them back. But these Pharisees, they were so big on that scripture, an eye for an eye. You mess me up. I may be nice now. If somebody once said, one pastor once made a statement which really made me feel very bad for, the, for him. He said, I was, I will use, just, I, I will use an, an arbitrary name. I was Mr. John before I became Pastor John. So don't, don't bring out my Mr. John because Mr. John would mess you up big time. Amen. See, that's terrible. That's terrible. That's terrible. So don't mess with me now because I'm a Christian, but before I became a Christian, I, don't bring that, don't, don't, don't push, watch out. You have a problem. You are not, you are a Christian. You are either a Christian or you are not. You cannot be a Christian when things are going right and switch back to be a thug when things are going wrong. Amen. There is one life. The Bible says, for all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become what? New. You are a new creature. You are a new creature. And I know some of us because of the teachings we've had in the past and because of our leaders that just act like that, we think it's all right. It is not right. You should not be a Christian one moment and you switch to be a non-Christian next moment depending on circumstances. You should be the same all the time. That means this. 
if somebody comes right now and, and, and have messed with, up with one of my children, it is not in my place to go mess with them. If they hurt my child and they come to my home and they mess up my child, I should show them love. I should even give them food. I should say, have a seat and I should forgive them. Pastor, is that right? Absolutely right. It is not in my place now to go and punish them because of what they've done. I'll make sure I take them to the law and let the law, civil authority, deal with them. But it's my place to love and to forgive. Amen? Amen. And, that's, and that's what Christ is talking about here. It is not in your place to put the law in your hand. Let the law. The Bible says that God is the one that, that puts leaders in positions. Let them deal with it. You play your part of loving and forgiving and let the law handle the law. Amen? Amen. The law, the magistrate is not supposed to deal with criminals the way you and I deal with criminals. Did I say it right? Yes. The magistrate should not say to you, I'm so sorry, you know, I, I really feel bad that you committed this crime, you know. I, I'm, I'm going to just uh, let you off the hook, you know. Um, Whenever you do the crime, I'll let you off the hook. You know, I just really have compassion towards you. You know, you know, I love you so much. You know, you committed a crime. You killed somebody last week. That's okay. You go free, please. Just don't do it again. But if you do, I'll still forgive you. I'm a good magistrate. No. The magistrate is supposed to follow the law, right? So that you, who is a victim, would not feel bad that this person killed my child and they go free. You want the law to take its course. So, so God put these laws in place so that you are not punished for more than the crime you committed and you are not punished for less than the crime you committed. You together? An eye for an eye. That means that if I take your eye, please don't take all of me. That's what he's saying. I mean, if I cut off your leg, please don't cut off two hands and two legs. Let the crime be punishable with an equal level of, 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 uh, of punishment. That's what that civil law was all about. If you, the Bible, even the law says, if you kill someone, you should be killed. Capital law, that is a capital punishment, isn't the Bible? So that means that if you did not kill somebody, somebody, how many of you have, have seen somebody killing somebody else because they were killed? You didn't get it. How many stories have you heard that because you killed me, that's why I killed you? How many have you seen that happen? How many people have killed somebody else because they killed them? You dead. You dead. You cannot kill somebody else because they killed you. So most time it's anger that pulls people to commit those heinous crimes. So what God is saying is that we don't do that is left to the civil law. This is about the civil law. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You kill somebody, the law makes sure that you, you, are, you are dead also. Amen? Amen? That is the law. That is the civil law. There's no place in, the, in this life that I've seen a dead man going to kill the other man because they killed him. I mean, I mean you're dead. Dead man can't go and kill him. I mean, if you are dead, that's it. But let the law handle it. But you should not go and take a gun to kill whoever killed your family member, because let the Lord take care of that. That's what Christ was saying. And the, and, and the Bible says in verse 39, but I say unto you, but I say unto you, that ye resist not evil. But whoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him also the other cheek. So now, this is where some people get it wrong. Resist, not evil. What does that mean? Does it mean you should let people ride over you? Does it mean you should let them just step on you as a footmat? 
That's not what the Bible is saying. That's not what it's saying. It says, resist not evil, because the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Amen? The Bible says, if somebody commit a sin in the church, rebuke them so that, so that others would or others will learn not to do the same thing. So God wants us to, 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 to rebuke, to, to not to let somebody ride over us. But I will explain to you what that means. We say resist not evil. What it means is to, it means not to set against the one who have wronged you. Not to set against. That means not to revenge. Resist not evil, not to set against the one who have wronged you. It's not saying you should let evil come to you. Let's say, for instance, somebody is coming to hurt you in your house. You should resist them. Amen? Amen? Amen. God is coming with a man that wants to kill you. Or just kill. The Bible says resist not evil. So cut off my neck. Will you do that? You're going to say, block them. Some of us are going to say, in the name of Jesus. And start speaking in tongues and do something quick. <laughs> So what the Bible is saying here is not saying that you should not resist. It's not saying resist evil means that you should let evil come upon you. It's saying you should not pay back. You should not revenge. Amen? You should not have that vindictive spirit. That because you've hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. What it's saying is that no matter what, don't do that. Because the Bible even says in the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 17. Romans 12, 17. Romans 12, 17. Romans 12, verse 17. Can, you, can somebody please read that out loud for us? You see that? No man should pay back evil for evil. That means if somebody hurts you, don't go and hurt them back. If I, I have one of my friends many years ago, this is just, it was really sad. Many years ago, this my friend lives in, in uh, we're not as close as we used to be. He lives in, in, um, in Texas. And uh, something happened between him and his, and his, uh, and, and his relationship. And he was so vindictive. I'm going to hurt her. Or I'm going to hurt him. I'm going to mess their life. I'm going to mess them up bad. So that I mean they would, because they tried to mess me. I want to mess them before they mess me. Now that, that is so ungodly. Amen? Amen? What he's saying is that recompense no man. Even for you. I mean, if somebody hurts you, don't plan to hurt them back. Because if you do, then you are not Christ-like. Amen? Amen? It's God's plan for us as his people to be Christ-like, to be just like Christ. That's why the Bible says, if you want to follow me, you must die to self. You cannot, do, you cannot follow Christ if self is in your head. You must die. What does dying to self really mean? Dying to self means somebody talk against you and you want to pay them back what they deserve and you keep your mouth shut. Dying to self means somebody hurt you so bad and you want to pay them back and you just swallow your pride. Dying to self means somebody really deserves to be punished by what they did to you and you let them just have it without giving them the peace of your mind. That's dying to self. Dying to self doesn't mean locking yourself up in the room and praying all day. Dying to self means letting go of your right. We live in a culture where we talk about right is my right is my right. Dying to self is letting go of all of your right and let God just control everything. Dying to self means refusing to defend yourself even when you know that you are right. Are you hearing me? 
Dying to self means, you know what, I know they're wrong, but I know my right, but I refuse to exercise my right. It's like what Paul said. Paul makes statement like this. Paul said, we have the right, Paul said, I have the right to benefit from you as your teacher, as your pastor. I have the right to gain from you. I have the right to receive benefit because of what I'm giving to you as a body. But Paul said, but I'm not. Paul said, I have the right to take one of the sisters here as a wife. I did not do that. So it doesn't mean that you always have to exercise your right. Paul said, you know what, I'm, here. I'm not married. I should be married and have a wife like the other apostles do. They have wives and they have, you know, they have houses, they get paid. I'm not. I don't have a wife. But I have the right to have a wife. Amen? Amen? Thank God I have a wife. Amen. I'm not Paul. But Paul was saying that. So you have to make sure that when you die to self means that you let go of your right. See, I know we are in a culture of right. Women right. What, what are the rights again we have here? Gay, huh? Gay, Gay right. Sexual orientation right. What are right again? Social right. Children right. Uh, minority right. Women right. Husband right. I guess it's husband right too. I see this. I think there is somewhere, I'm sure. Some men are making some right for themselves. <laughs> Check it, you'll be amazed. I think there is. Husband right. Please, husband right. Union right. Rights, rights, rights. Dying to self mean letting go of your rights. And letting God just rule. Say, but pastor, you mean I should just, what is my right? Yes, it's self. It is self that wants right. So it, means it is self that wants right. Whenever you say it's my right, it means that I want self to take control. You, do, you do get that? Whenever you say to yourself, it is my right to be happy, it means that myself got to be on top. It is my right. Now, there are four rights, I believe, four things that Christ touched on the scriptures. I think I'm going to go right into that. Uh, the American, uh, we, the, the statement we make here, uh, the right to dignity, right to the arms, right for security, right for dignity, right to own your property, and right to be... There are four rights. I think I wrote them there. Yeah. Okay. Right of dignity, right for... For, for security, right for, uh, for freedom, and also right to own property, like arms, have your properties. Dignity, security, and uh, uh, freedom, and also property. And Christ nailed this thing on the scripture. I will show it to you how he nailed it. And Americans deal with this right. And many people of all over the world, they say, it's my right of dignity. I need to be respected. I deserve it. You don't respect me. That's self. Somebody say self. self. I mean, you don't respect me. Now you're talking about me. That's already self. I have the right to be free. I'm not free. I'm not free to do what I want to do. Now, who is that? Self. And Christ was knock, knocking these things down. Many times we think that these things were developed by us, Americans. But no, it's the Bible. This right of human right of dignity and freedom and security and, and, and own your property is, is written in the Bible. And Christ just messed, messed them up completely there. Let's start with that. Let's, maybe we should deal with that and see how these things are messed, how Christ tried to break these things down. Now let's look at verse 38 again. Verse 38 of our scripture. Matthew 5:38. Ye have heard that it has been said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Verse 39. But I say to you, resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, that is, 
the right of dignity. Someone you say dignity. What Christ is saying here is that in the Jewish um, uh, culture, the greatest insult you can give to a man, to anybody, is to slap them. Amen. Slap. How many of you have been slapped before? And you saw double, your eyes, you saw a flash. <laughs> I like. A slap means that, I mean, the slave back then would rather be, be whipped than slapped. Slapped means that you are nothing. If, <laughs> let me tell you something here. It is bad enough, come brother, brother uh, Sawa, it is bad enough, I, I'm going to slap but I'm doing very, very easy. <laughs> it's real best. It's all right, I got tough face. <laughs> tough face. Let me make sure the face is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, my hands are big too. It is bad enough. <laughs> oh, grandkids. Oh, we have grandkids. It is bad enough to be slapped with the right hand, right? Like this. Most times the slap is done with the right hand. Nobody, most slap is the right hand, right? Like, boza. <laughs> but the worst, the worst, the worst insult is backhand. Jesus Christ said, smite on the right cheek. Right cheek means the person is going. You get it? Because you cannot smite the right cheek like this. Nobody slap like this. <laughs> Lift up your right hand. Put it back down. That is right. People slap like the greatest insult on your dignity. Are you getting it? Christ said, if Whoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, backhand. Boah. <laughs> he said, turn to him the other also. What is he saying here? He said, before you revenge, give them another opportunity to slap you again. Right. And, ah, that African man. Slap me again? Jesus. Are you serious with this thing? Jesus means it. Kai. Jesus said, when they resist no evil, but if whoever shall smite thee with your back, that is the lowest disrespect, dignity, you have just been reduced to nothing. Check it out in your dictionary. When the Jewish, the, 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 their culture, their slap is the is, is the worst disrespect. You slap somebody. Ultimate disrespect to slap. And to slap with a backhand, it means that you are just being reduced to nothing. The Bible says about dignity. If you, this is what it said, let go of your right of dignity. Because you have a heavenly dignity that awaits you in his kingdom. Somebody say amen. amen. So what Christ is saying here, an eye for an eye, two for a two, that's not right. He said, that is a civil law. What he said, resist no evil. If somebody slaps you with a backhand, don't revenge. Don't try to slap them back. Give them another opportunity to even slap you again. <laughs> but I'm asking, Pastor, are you serious? <laughs> yes. It's just saying, do not revenge. Do not revenge. Don't revenge. He's not saying, okay, you slap me here, all right, come on, come, come, do it on that side. It's not saying that. It's saying, don't revenge. Give, before you even think of revenge, give them another opportunity to do that again. Like somebody shared a testimony with me, Brother Mark. Shared a testimony with me. I believe with some group of brothers here. I don't know if, who was with me at that particular moment. That he was somewhere in the past and somebody slapped him. And he was a practicing Christian 
that was known in that particular circle. And everybody was watching to see what he was going to do. And he refused to slap back. And when he did not slap back, he had the greatest accolade or respect you could ever imagine from his peers and his superiors that he did not revenge. But that is dying to self. Because self says, you slap me, just wait. Do you know I have some muscles here? I'm going to give you a blow. <laughs> and you'll mess your face up. Like somebody once said somewhere. The person said, you are lucky I didn't, I didn't, I didn't mess, I didn't design your face. But that's terrible. But you will have to understand this. Christ is teaching us here, don't revenge. Vengeance is not of God. And that's why many people would not want to teach on this area because many humans, even some of our leaders, are just so willing to just show revenge and vengeance. You mess with me, I'm coming after you. That is not what Christ is teaching. He said, if you mess with me, I would rather not come after you. I would like God to deal with it. Amen? Amen. You may have a seat. I may call you back again. Give a hand of applause to him. And that reminds me of a story, a story of a lady whose husband drinks a lot. <laughs> He's a drunkard. He comes home drinking and causes all kind of trouble. And the woman met the pastor and said, Pastor, no, I'm tired of this man. He comes home, he's drinking. He smells drink and he walks around just, I've tried, I have, I've talked, I have stressed him out with my words, I've cursed him out, I've even whipped him with my, uh, with, with my frying pan and he's still not changing. What can I do? I have cursed him, I have refused him intimacy, I have not been a good wife to him, I have even done nothing, I mean, I have been so bad, but he has not changed. What should I do? The pastor told him, told her, go home and heap a coal of fire on his head. He said, really, I should do that? Heap a coal of, yes, if you do that, he will change. I don't know if you know what it means to have a coal of, heap a coal of fire on somebody's head. What does it mean? Huh? Kindness. But she, she didn't get it. She thought she meant, Jesus Christ said, when you are kind to your enemies, it's like you are heaping a coal of fire on your head. Because they expect you to pay them back evil and you are just being nice. They confuse. Amen. Try it out. People that are mean to you, just be nice to them. They're just confused. They are just lost. They don't know what to do with themselves. Amen. They expect you to cause them back. Say, God bless you. What? Is that what you're going to say? God bless you. God bless you. You're not even cursing them back. They expect you to curse them back and you're blessing them. They confuse. They messed up now. Now, that's worse. But if you have cursed them back, guess what? They have more curses under their sleeves to release. But when you bless them, God bless you, all is well, the Lord is good, hallelujah. They say, my God, what's wrong with this man? Are you, are, they'll curse you again, they say, God still bless you with a smile. Say, my God, this guy is a mess. God still bless you. So, and by doing that, Christ basically said, you are heaping the coal of fire on their head. And they are bound to change. Amen. So he's saying, don't smite back. Don't revenge. Look at the next one. Verse 40. If any man would sue thee, you see, now this is not, in the scripture here, Christ is talking about we being sued. Amen? Sister Telisha, right? We are sued. Not we, not we suing the other person. Because Christians are not supposed to, to take pride in suing. There are some pastors I heard of, some of them I even know, that love suing because they feel that is a way to get money for their ministry. What's wrong? The Bible says, what a shame if two brothers would sue each other. What a shame. Now you can't settle your matters outside of court and you sue me, I sue you on money and all kind of stuff like that. Christ said, if any man would sue thee at the law, 
and take thy coat. Let him have thy cloak also. Now, this really messed them up because the cloak, the Bible says, the Lord says in the book of Exodus, the Lord says, never give anyone your cloak more than a day. That means if I borrow money to you and you want to pay me back and you pay me back with your cloak, your cloak is like, it's like a blanket. It's like what they cover themselves in the cold and it's very cold in Jerusalem. I must return it back to you because you, you need to sleep with it. Most people only have one cloak. And now Christ is saying, if he wants to take your coat, give him your cloak. So wait a minute. The law says, don't give them your cloak for more than 12 hours. And you're asking us to let them have our most valuable things. What Christ is saying here, if somebody sues you, trying to take you to court, and most times it's because you've done something wrong, and they sue you for $10, Give to them what they deserve. Give them. Be a peacemaker. Be a person of Christ who is willing to go beyond. You say, I owe you $5, I'll give you 7 Does that make you feel better? I owe you 8 I'll just make it 10 for you. Right? I owe you 15 How about if I give you 20 Please, I'm sorry for, you know, for the suit, for even making you go through that. What a witness are you giving for Christ? So like, no, I'm going to fight you to the end. You will not get a dime from me. I'm going to make sure you pay the attorney's fees and I'm paying nothing because I have my right. Here yeah, Christ says, if somebody sued you, what do you do with them? Give them your clothes. Now what is that talking about? Where are we? Verse 40. That is talking about Security. Somebody, somebody say security. security. It's talking about because that clock is their security. It's their security blanket. They need it to be secure. They need it to feel that they are protected at night against the elements. And Christ is saying, give up the right of your security. We've talked about dignity. They slap you, let dignity, the right of dignity, forget about it. Security. The right of security, let it go. Don't feel, don't tell, don't hold on to this right, my right, my right, my right. When you let go of your right, that is how you die to self. I, I don't know for some of you, but this happens to me. Sometimes I drive and, and somebody wants, somebody is tailgating me and it's like really upset because they feel it's their right, they feel I'm supposed to speed. And I'm, I'm driving normal, but they think I'm driving too slow in one lane. And there are cars in front of me. And they, what I do, I just wait, pull my car aside, let two or three cars go before, then I go back on the road. Because I just, it's, it's like giving up your right. It's my right. The speed limit says 45. I'm going 45. What is your problem, Right? Right? It says 45, I'm going 45. What is your problem? You just stay there. I'm going to go 45 as long as I can. I'm obeying the law. It's your right. But to avoid troubles in your life, there's nothing wrong in giving up that right and pull it aside and let them go. Amen. You have peace of mind and also you probably avoid getting shot by somebody who is losing their mind. Amen. And, Life can be so sweet if we just follow the words of Christ. It becomes stressless and no, we call no wahala, no stress. You just, just refuse to be stressed. Say, I am too blessed to be stressed. <laughs> so when you follow Christ's word, then you are really stressless. Stress comes about our life when we are clinging to this. Right, this, right, this, me, 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 me. Forget about me, me, me. I'm talking about him, him, him. The Bible even says, esteem the other higher than yourself. Amen. So the right of security, let it go. 41 talks about the right of freedom, choice. Whoever shall compare thee to go a mile, go with him too. I'll tell you what that means. 
In the Persian world back then, in those days, and many times Americans, we think that we think we invented the postal system. We did not. The postal system, postal mail, have been in existence way, way back then. What they did was th there is a route. There is a mail route with mailboxes. If, if, if you remember back then, in like Nigeria, even in my time, back then, you have to go somewhere to pick your mail. The mails are not delivered to the house. There's a location where all the mails go, and you go there and pick whatever mail. They probably just have your name in there. There's, God, the houses are not numbered. There are no addresses. There's no 24 Mill Creek Road. It doesn't exist. They just say Mill Creek Road for everybody. So you just go and pick your mail. But then the Roman government were actually in control at that time of, of the region. So there are different posts, mail posts along the routes. So many times people avoid that route. Because if anyone, like a, a leader or the boss, sees you traveling that route, he can tell you, okay, no, I have a package for you to deliver in San, San Francisco. And because you are in that route, and he's a Roman soldier, he's a Roman soldier, you have no choice but to take the package and mess up your trip. Are you getting it? So you can know where this is coming from. It's not referring to go mad to Bethlehem or go to Allentown. No, no, this is different. He's talking about there are different locations, different posts. So he's saying if you are compelled, compelled mean uh, force, to go a man, maybe they tell you right now, Brasawa, come here again. Brasawa is, is going to, is going to, uh, to Reading and have a package that has to be delivered in York. Because I'm the boss, I'm the Roman soldier, I have a package for you. This package goes to York. He may say, oh, no, I can go to York, I'm going to Reading. And, and, and start forcing on. Jesus Christ said, you know what? If they say go to York, Go to Baltimore. Did you get it? Go beyond. If, they are, if, you, if you are forced to go a mile, go what? Beyond. If you are forced to go to York, go to Baltimore. Go past where, where you're asked to go. So how do we apply that principle in our life? It means that if your boss, for instance, your boss tells you you must stay until 6 to finish this work, stay till 7. Clock out at seven and see what happens in your life. You've just done something to him that would stay in his heart forever. Each time he's trying to think he's punishing you, you're actually heaping coals in his head because you are proving him wrong that you are a follower of Christ. And what Christ is saying is that if it is, it is your right not to go because it's your right to only end your journey in Reading. And Christ said, give up your right. Are you getting this? Give up the freedom of your choice and let it go. Somebody say freedom. freedom. Somebody say right. right. So I know you have the right to your body, but let it go. I know you have the right to your sleep and you have been forced not to sleep. Stay awake if you can. I would not say go drink coffee because I don't drink coffee, but just stay awake. If you can. I mean, go the extra mile. Go beyond the call. Don't allow anyone to make you not be Christ-like. Don't allow anyone to make you not to be Christ-like. So what Christ is saying here, if you, if you are compelled, compelled, if you are forced to go a mile, go beyond a mile. Let go of the right of freedom. Give a clap to Brother Sawa again. the right of freedom. That is verse 41. Now look at verse 42. Verse 42. Property. Right of property. We talk about right of dignity, right of security, right of freedom. Number four is right of property. And this is America. We have a right. We have, everybody have the right to their property. If you, if I, when we used to live, I believe even in Allen, even in Allentown, happens too. But more in York. Like some, some people, if, 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 your, if, your, if our kid will go through their property, man, they are in serious 
upset. They don't want nobody walking through their property. I mean, when you are neighbors, a trespasser, they call it. Let's assume that his boss, let's assume that his school bus is right there. They can just cross over your yard to get the school bus. Now they have to go all the way, all that way, and all that way. What is going to take them just two minutes to cross over because a neighbor wants to protect their property rights. A child in the winter cold and have to walk a whole length of a whole block, another block, another block to get to where you could just go through their, your neighbor's yard. Christ said to you, let go of the right of property. How does, that, how does that apply in the scripture? Give to him that asks thee. Now, is Christ saying give money to everybody? He's not saying that. See, you must understand what Christ means here. Borrow to whoever comes for borrow. Is Christ saying give money to whoever asks to borrow? No, he's not saying that. What is just saying? Give whatever you are holding on to, whatever right you think you have, release it. Because everyone have the right to their money. So I have the right to my money. Exactly. But Christ said, give it away. He said, if give him that asks thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, don't refuse them. I mean, borrow whoever want to borrow, and give whoever wants. But that's not what Christ is saying. What Christ is basically saying in the scripture is let go of that right. That property is mine and I, and I have the right to it to myself. Release it. It's not saying you go and give all of your belongings to somebody because they ask you. Oh, Brother Sawa or Pastor Duke, I, I, I want your car. Oh, sure, you can have it. I want your car. It's not saying that. Otherwise, Christians will be in trouble in this world. <laughs> Come to ask Christians, I want your house. Sure. I, I, I want your husband. You can have him. <laughs> that, that, that would be a no, no, no. That's not what he's saying. He's just saying, let go of those rights. Because it is an issue of rights that make people to go hurt somebody else. You hurt my tooth, I'm coming after you. It's my right. To defend myself. But Christ says, No, I am your defender. Right? <laughs> and this is a problem with some marriages which I would talk about in our uh, in our marriage class. You know, maybe not too good for these kids here. But as for men or women who believe I have the right to my body. Don't touch me, it is mine. The man says, no, 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 don't touch me. How many men say that, don't touch me? It's my body. <laughs> the, men, the men are laughing. <laughs> you, mean, you, mean just, you mean men don't do that? Only women? Ask Brother Jakes now, I'm sure he does that sometimes. I hope not. <laughs> I think if you do that, she won't be posting all those lovely stuff about husbands on Facebook. <laughs> she posts too much love on that Facebook. What does she post? Something of her husband. What is it? What is it called? Husband something. Husband and wife for life. <laughs> she won't post that if you tell her, this is my body, please. Don't you touch me right now. Wait until six months later. That post, she will pull them down. <laughs> Quickly. That night, you'll be surprised. That post is coming down. <laughs> it's what? A, <laughs> Abandonment. But what Christ is saying here really is that let go of those rights. Let Christ be the center of your life. Now, what is the main theme of this of today's study is that we are not supposed to revenge. That's what it's all about. And I will show up about two or three more scriptures to, to conclude with that. Uh, we've, we've read Romans chapter 12, verse 17 already. Let us do, um, let's read uh, Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs 25, verse 21, and Proverbs 24, verse 29. Proverbs 25, 21, and Proverbs 24, 
29. Okay. So as you go to that, let me do a quick recap. Make sure this actually sticks to your spirit. We read verse 39 is giving up the right of dignity. Verse 40, the right of security. Verse 41, the right of freedom. Verse 42, the right of property. Don't hold on to those things. If somebody offends you, if somebody messes up any of these rights, don't revenge them. That's what Christ is saying. If somebody messes up your right of dignity, don't pay them back. If somebody messes up your right of security, don't pay them back. If somebody messes up your right of, of freedom, don't revenge. If somebody messes up your right of property, don't revenge. Don't say, because you slice my tires, I'm going to slice yours too. Don't say, because you, you hurt my property, I'm going to hurt your property. Or because you mess up my security, I'm going to mess up your security. Or because you, 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 you made a fool of me, I'm going to make sure I make a fool of you. And you will regret forever thinking of making a fool of me. Because the one I'm going to do to you will be worse. And that is the devil. Christians don't act like that. Amen? Amen. Look at what 25 verse 21. If thy enemy be hungry, what do you do? Pray. If he be thirsty, <laughs> you see that? That is Christ talking there. In the Old Testament too. We're going to deal with that, I'm sure, in the next section of this teaching. If your enemy be hungry, give him bread. If he needs, if he's thirsty, give him water. Don't say, you know what? You're my enemy, you're going to starve. I'm giving you no food. That's not it. Thank God for America. Sometimes I think of many things. You know, if in this country, in many parts of this country, if you have a dog and a human being outside that is in the snow, do you know people would let, rather let the dog in and keep the man outside? Well, in America, it's something else. Oh, yeah. Is it all, dog, come here, put it, put it, dog. You human being, you stay and die in the cold. Because I don't trust you. But that's... I can understand many things go on here. But it is God's purpose and plan for us to not pay back our enemies. That's why I said to you last week, pray that God would keep your enemies what? Alive. So that when God prepares a table before you, they will see you eating from that table. They say, ah, I wish I didn't do that to Brother Wale. I wish I let him hang around. Now he's really eating from a high table. Maybe he would have called me to be part of that table. You see? So, pray that God will keep your enemies, right? Right? Pray that God will keep your enemies alive. So, don't wish them to die, please. There are some churches that say, God, kill them, kill them. No, don't kill your enemies. Let them be alive. Let them see you enjoy. It is better when your enemies see you enjoying. Because if they die, then... Let them see you eating from the high table with God. Let them see you moving in ministry. Let them see you serving God faithfully. Let them that say you'll never make it, see you make it. That is where you really enjoy victory in God. When those who thought you amount to nothing, see God elevate you to somebody. So don't pray for enemies to die. If they, lot, if they want bread, and if you have the bread, give to them. If they want water and you have it, give to them. Amen? Amen? 24 verse 29. Say not, I will do so to him as he had done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. You know, that's what I'm talking about here. Don't, don't even say it. You do this to me, I'm going to pay you back. Don't even say that. Pay good for evil. Say not, I will do to him as he had done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. Do not say that. Don't have that revengeful, that vengeance spirit. It is not God's plan for us as his children to live like that. And that's why this is very difficult 
for people to teach because to teach this and to hear this challenges you to live right. Because you cannot go to someone on the mount and have a church that is not following Christ. You got to because these things go right core to, the, to our life. God is speaking to every one of us. The more I study this book of Matthew, the more my life is, the more I check my life, make sure my life is right. Because it speaks to every one of us, including me. For me to study this and to teach it is, God has transformed my life so much just for studying God's word even more and more into in depth, seeing what Christ really wants us to do. So God wants us to be, like I said a post a couple days ago, becoming like Jesus. I don't know if you saw that post, becoming like Jesus. That is, that is the whole of God's agenda. He wants Jesus to have, Jesus is the firstborn, and he wants him to have many brethren, brothers and sisters, and that's who we are. So he's making us to be more like Christ. And to be more like Christ, and Christ is teaching us in the scripture how we can be more like him. And this is what it is. The beatitude, the beatitude, how to be more like Christ. The sermon on the mount, how to be more like Christ. And if you can be more like Christ, then God's agenda for your life has already been fulfilled. It is not about the other things we, 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 we struggle for. It's about being more like Jesus. If you are more like Jesus, then the plan of God for your life has already been fulfilled. Amen?